Praise the Lord. Uh, we are now in the series of Elijah, a man like us. So far we have seen how God led Elijah to come into, in front of Ahab and declare that there won't be any rain uh, for three and a half years and till it accord, just according to his word. He said, I am the man who is standing in front of God. And God asks Elijah, go and hide yourself in the brook, Cherith. When the brook dries up, God leads him to the widow. And after many months, God's word comes again to Elijah. But before that, he goes through a series of things, which in three and a half years, there are two points to remember. First is Elijah's preparation. He went from being Elijah the Tishbite to the last verse of the chapter 17, he became the man of God. Everything that Elijah experienced in that time, he had to depend on God as much as the widow. He had to depend on God for healing of the widow's son. He had to depend on God for all the things in his life till the point when God tells him, go now and show yourself or into Ahab, to Ahab. The second point we need to understand is three and a half year famine. Why did you think God put that famine for three and a half years? This was supposed to teach the people of Israel a lesson that the ba Baal whom they were following after giving up God Yahweh was a God who was useless. He was supposed to be the God of fertility. He is supposed to be the God of crops. He is supposed to be the God of rain. And over three and a half years God had proved to the people that he was a fraud. They had done lots of worship. They had lots of pujas. They have done lots of things. No matter how many prayers had been offered, no much how many worship they did, the rain would not come. The people were starting to rethink about Baal and were, I think, prepared to return to Je Jehovah. Jezebel attempt to prevent this worship of Jehovah is by killing all the priests and the prophets. And... Uh, uh, you know, and people were getting angry with her. Uh, you see, before this Yahweh God, no other God will stand. We see the truth in the Old Testament. We see the truth in the New Testament. You know, uh, there was once a situation in Israel where the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines. And they took it to their temple and uh, they put, him, put uh, the Ark of the Covenant in the temple of Dagon. You know who Dagon is? Dagon is the father of Baal. So they put it in the, the, in, in the uh, temple of Dagon. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel 5.3 and, and when they of Ashdod rose early in the morrow, on the morrow, behold Dagon was fallen on, the, on his face on the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. No God can stand before our God. Say praise the Lord. Praise Hallelujah. The Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. In the New Testament, we see the same thing. Lord Jesus, who is the image and express image of the Father, who has come down for us on the cross, when He came, um, He came across these evil spirits. In Matthew 8, 29, it says, And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, the Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before our time? These gods, these sorcerers, these magicians are powerless before God. A believer can never, can never, never be possessed by an evil spirit. If he was, she was, if he or she is possessed, that means he was never a believer or she was never a believer in the first place. Those child sacrifices, those worships, those pujas, those so prayers did not to Baal did not bring any rain. The famine was very painful. So two points to remember. In this three and a half years of famine, Elijah's preparation and no uh, precipitation or no rain. Many times we give very uh, little attention to the scripture as we read. But you must read the, uh, you know, behind the scenes. You must read what God wants to talk to us. God is saying that it took three and a half years to train Elijah for the next thing what he is going to see in 1 Kings 18. You know, and God says to Elijah, 
you go now and see Ahab. You know, the, after, it says in the first verse, 18 of 18th chapter, the Bible says, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah. <laughs> Excuse me. In the third year saying, Go show thyself to, unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was sore famine in Samaria. The effects of the famine <laughs> was very sore. And now it was time to bring rain. Now was the time for Elijah to show himself to Ahab. At that last meeting, three and a half years earlier, Ahab, um, Elijah had told Ahab, there won't be rain except at my word. So it was only fair that he had to come and show himself to the king. Therefore he has to personally appear before Ahab. The king who has been searching for him for three and a half years, he has to come and show himself. So what happens? And uh, uh, as he came from Zarephath to Samaria, again back 160 um, kilometers, he came across a man called Obadiah. <clears throat> now we read about Obadiah. You know, uh, in the in the uh, verses it says, King Ahab calls Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. You can call him the chief or his chief of staff who made everything run smoothly. That was his job. Now it says about Obadiah, one thing about Obadiah we should remember, he feared the Lord greatly. It's a great statement about a man. Can the Lord tell about you and me that we fear the Lord? <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry about this. Can God... The Lord tell about us this like this, that we fear the Lord greatly. We have to check our lives, my dear brothers and sisters. It says, for now Abadiah feared the Lord greatly, for it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them in fifty in a cave and fed them bread and water. We are introduced to a man named Obadiah. This is the only time he appears. <coughs> Excuse me. The name Obadiah literally means servant of Yahweh. Obadiah means servant of Jehovah. But exactly who was Jehovah? Who, sorry, who was Obadiah? These uh, verses tell us two important things about Obadiah. That he was in charge of Ahab's house. And he feared the Lord greatly. <laughs> Excuse me. These two facts on the surface seem to be at cross purposes. <laughs> Obadiah was not the first man that God had put in a place of this position of influence. Thank you. We think, if you put, uh, think back to Joseph, he was also put in a prominent position in the Pharaoh's court. He was the prime minister. We can also think of Daniel. He served as the prime minister to many kings. And then, uh, of course, we cannot forget Nehemiah, who was the cup bearer in the court, or in the Persian court. Or even we cannot forget Esther, who was the queen of the Persian court. <clears throat> in each of these situations, God had put somebody of his influence, of uh, uh, inf uh, his person, in a position of influence. Obadiah too was placed in a position of considerable influence. He was, as I said, he was the chief of staff of the king's household. It was his job to keep everything in the king's house running smoothly. And we also had said that he feared the Lord greatly. Unlike the king who was the most wicked king ever was in the history of Israel, he, he did not worship the false idol Baal. You imagine how difficult it must be for a man like Obadiah to do this. <coughs> but verse 4 indicates, uh, brings some more, something more about Obadiah. It says he took a hundred prophets whom Jezebel was about to kill and hid them and gave them water and bread. You know, Jezebel was trying to do everything to remove the worship of Jehovah from Israel. And Obadiah was here hiding and protecting them. Every second of the time, Obadiah's life was in danger. Because if he was found out, he would be killed too. But 
he used his position of influence to save 100 prophets and <clears throat> Obadiah was on a an errand for the king when he met Elijah. The next verse says, And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land, and to all the fountains of water, and to all the brooks. Peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and the mules alive, that we lose not all the bees. So they divided the land between them to pass throughout it. Ahab went one way, Obadiah went another way by himself. It was while on this errand to the king that Obadiah meets Elijah. Just imagine it is so sad the fact that after three and a half years of famine, Ahab is looking for what? Grass for his horses. He is not bothered about the food for his people in the famine. He is more concerned about his horses than the people. Verse 7 says, And Obadiah was in the way. Behold, Elijah met him and he knew him fell on his face and said, Art thou my Lord Elijah? It was when Obadiah was going in search of this grass that he meets Elijah. Obadiah recognizes him right away because Elijah is not like a common man. He is a rough man. You know, you could easily make out his Elijah. He, he had mysteriously disappeared three and a half years ago and you know, Obadiah couldn't believe it that he is seeing Elijah. So he says, is it really you? Is it you? Art thou my Lord, Elijah? Elijah answers in next verse. He says, go and tell Ahab uh, uh, that Elijah is here. And now Obadiah is afraid. You can understand because he says in the next verse, why, what have I seen that thou wouldst deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation nor kingdom whither my Lord hath not um, <coughs> sent to seek thee. And when they said he is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and the nation that they found thee not. And now thou sayest, go tell thy Lord, behold Elijah is here. And it shall, this is his fear. And as it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from thee, that the spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not, so that when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he will slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. Then he tells him, what all he did for the Lord. Was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? How I hid an hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave, and fed them with, fed them with bread and water. And now says, Go, thy, tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and he shall slay me. Obadiah, you can understand, was afraid to go. He thought it was a total death sentence, because if, if he goes and tells King yeah, Elijah is here, and the king comes there and doesn't find Elijah, he's going to think that Obadiah is playing a trick on him and get him killed. You know, uh, he, because... He, Obadiah was not sure because last time when um, Elijah came to the king and then he disappeared three and a half years, no one could find them. They had searched every nook and corner but they could not find. It's only logical to think that. Um, but you know, um, I think Obadiah was counting the cost. He didn't mind losing his life for the Lord but he didn't want to lose his life for nothing. Charles Spurgeon in one, in one of his writings about Obadiah, he says, Elijah was a man of action, bold and always to the front, nothing to conceal. Obadiah was a quiet believer, true and steadfast, but in a very difficult position and therefore driven to perform his duty in a less open manner. His faith in the Lord swayed his life but did not drive him out of the court. Obadiah was a quiet man because of his situation but Elijah was brash because he was the prophet of God. You see in the Lord's army there are prophets and priests. The prophets are called by God to speak boldly, rebuking sin, calling to righteousness. The priests are called by God to comfort the hurting people all around and to minister healing in the name of Jesus. I have Rarely prophets understand the priests and priests understand the prophets. Prophets often look at priests and say you are weak, you are very uh, you know, mild. While the priests look at the prophets and think they are very harsh and uncaring. But both are called by the Lord. Both are called for the kingdom of God. 
both have important jobs to do. Someone has to speak out and take the heat. Someone has to bind up the wounded. Someone has to declare God's word. Someone has to help the hurting. Someone has to take a stand and fight. Someone has to take the casualties. Army, in an army, all cannot be fighters. Some are fighters, some are planners, some are he he um, healers. No, everyone cannot be healers, everyone cannot be fighters. You need to have both at the same time, even if they don't agree, right? If you are Elijah, don't despise Obadiah. Amen? If Obadiah serves the Lord where you could not serve, Elijah could never serve in the position of Obadiah. So if you are Obadiah, don't reject Elijah and say that he is harsh. He is doing his job for the Lord. Amen? I think Elijah really sympathized with Obadiah. He says, and Elijah said in the 16th verse, he says, um, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So he's, he assured Obadiah in the name of God that he will show himself to the Lord today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab comes to meet Elijah. As soon as he comes, Ahab says, and it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said unto him, Art thou him that troubleth Israel? You see, Ahab has so much forgotten about the Lord that he cannot think beyond the prophet. He thinks it is the prophet who had the power to do all these things. He has lost sight of God. Many times believers do that. They lose sight of God and they think the prophet is everything. The healer is everything. The evangelist everything. That's where we make the mistake, my dear brothers and sisters. Above all of us is God. Our eyes should be on God. The prophet, the priest, the pastor, the healer, the evangelist are only agents of this almighty God. You see, Elijah answers um, Ahab and he says, I have not troubled Israel. But you and your father's house, in that you have forget, forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed Balim. Therefore, send and gather to me all Israel unto the Mount of Carmel and the prophets of Baal 450 and the prophets of the groves 400 which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. You see, Ahab comes and accuses, uh, accuses Elijah. But Elijah says, I have not troubled Israel. This has come because of you. This has come because you are guilty of forsaking the word of God. As a result, you have followed Baal. The fundamental problem when we, we accumulate idols in our life is when we forsake the word of God. This is a thumb rule, my dear brothers and sisters. If you are neglecting the word of God, there are so many idols in your life, it accumulates. You cannot but be because you are that, that desire to seek God will seek other avenues. It will seek other avenues. So it is better to seek the word of God to prevent the idols. Amen? Make the word of God the primary thing in our life. This is what Ahab failed to do. In, in verse 19, Elijah says, Gather all Israel on Mount Carmel, and 450 prophets of Baal, and 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. Now the scene is set for a showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And the appointed time they meet on Mount Carmel. And you know, we pick up the story uh, in 20, verse 21. It says, Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long you halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If it's Baal, Baal, then follow him. And the people answered not a word. Now we are going into the most spectacular display of the power of God. But we have four lessons to learn, my dear brothers and sisters. I want you to listen carefully and learn these four lessons. First lesson, if you want to be the channel of the power of God, if you want to stand in the place where Elijah is standing, number one, you have to step up 
and be counted. You have to step up and be counted. Elijah issues a challenge to the people. The, the half-hearted effort of people, the wavering practice of the Israelites is clearly shown here. The word halt means they are not decided between two opinions. That is a person who never makes up their mind of what position or action or attitude they are going to take. They were not completely sold out to Baal, nor they were following the Lord Jehovah. I want to illustrate this uh, in the, with a point which happened in the life of uh, President uh, Ronald Reagan. Uh, when he was a young boy, one of his aunt took him to a cobbler to make shoes for him. The cobbler asked young, young Reagan, do you want square toes or round toes? Unable to decide, Regan did not answer. So the cobbler gave him a few days. And several days later, the cobbler saw Regan on the street and asked him again what kind of toes he wants on his shoes. Regan still couldn't decide. So the shoemaker said, well, come by in a couple of days, your shoe will be ready. So when the future president went to the cobbler, after a few days, he found the shoe, one had square toe, one had round toe. And the, the shoemaker told him, this will teach you never to let people make decisions for you. Um, and the cobbler said in his, uh, to his customer, I, then Regan said, I learned right then and there, if you don't make your decisions, someone else will. This is the scriptural golden truth, guilt edge truth. My dear brothers and sisters, you have to make a decision. God's word, every time you read God's word, it asks for a decision. You must be for him or against him. You cannot be both. He will not perm permit neutrality. He will not permit a gray area. It has to be either black or white. He said in Matthew uh, 12, 30, Lord Jesus said, he who is not with me is against me. You have to take the stand in front of your family. You have to take the stand in front of your friends. You have to take your stand in front of your colleagues, business customers. Any stranger who passes you should know that you are taking a stand for God. Many times we hide our faith. That is indecision, my dear brothers and sisters. Romans 1.16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Imagine if you know a place where if you go there and sign your name, they give you $10,000, will you hide that truth? Only once you get it. No, you will go and tell your relatives, you will go and tell your friends, you will convince, they will not believe you, but you will say, no, see, I got this 10,000, why don't you go and get it, right? That's what you will be your reaction. That is how you should deal with the gospel. The gospel is precious beyond value. That is what has been given. That's how we have to go with that urgency, with that uh, passion, we have to go and tell the gospel. Not just uh, tell the gospel because we have to do it, but tell the gospel because you have something valuable and they need it. Right? That's the difference. Many times we are so shy or afraid to, uh, to put forth the gospel. The God demands us to take a stand. The Israelites did not take a stand. They stood on the sidelines. They were spectators. Today's brainwashing in the people is like this. They, they want, they, they, only the pastor can do the great things. Only the pastor can pray for healing. Only the pastor can do miracles. The rest of the people have just to agree with him or go along with him. That is a false system of the gospel. Every one of us, every believer has the power to do signs, wonders and miracles because it follows the faith of the person. It doesn't follow the position of the person. Signs, wonders, miracles follow the person who is of faith. Remember this, we have to be, if you want to be the channel of God's glory, you have to stand up. You have to step up and take a stand. It stand. It is so sad that um, in, uh, you know, uh, that people uh, very rarely take a stand. 
the you know, the Bible says that here the Israelites when uh, Elijah said why heart between two op opinions decide the people did not answer him a word that is the indecision among the greatest sickness attend uh, affecting today's Christianity indecision spiritual indecision is the greatest sickness the inability of God's people to make up their minds to decide which side they are really on the inability of young people adults singles those who are married every age group <coughs> they are very difficult to decide which team you are on some we would be wise to recollect the um, verse which God which the Lord said to the church of Laodicea which we are today the Laodicean church he said in Revelation 3.16 so then because the word lukewarm neither cold nor hot I will spew you out of my mouth the reason was clear they were neither here nor there they were lukewarm and this is very I uh, mean uh, disgusting to God to, to say nothing to God is saying no to God many times people are afraid oh Lord I want to grow then trials will come they are afraid of trials what you are telling God is no so you are against God many hundreds of years earlier Joshua had give, given this famous challenge in Joshua 24 15 and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord choose you this day whom you will serve whether the gods of your which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the god of the Amorites in whose land you are going to dwell but as for me and my house we will serve the Lord that my dear brothers and sisters you have to make a decision in this time this is not a time where you can have two opinions the world I want the world and I want the Lord we cannot we cannot uh, you know waver between these two things so number one if you want to be the channel of the power of God like how Elijah was you have to step up and be counted number two sec second thing if you want to be a channel of the power of God you have to be willing to stand alone Maybe sometimes no one will join you. In verse 22, the Bible says, Elijah said to the people, I, even I only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces, lay on the wood and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on the wood and put no fire under. And ye call on the name of your gods, I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answereth by fire let him be God and all the people then said oh it's a well spoken it is good this was designed to be a fair contest this he said each devotee and in their case 450 devotees were given the same test it, one bullock on each altar and they were to call on their God he who answered by fire would be the true God. You know, the worship of Baal was a very degraded uh, religion. It was a strange mixture of idolatry, uh, perverted sexuality and child sacrifice. Baal was worshipped as the god of uh, uh, crops and productivity. And uh, he was the god of rain. He had the power of lightning and if, if he could do anything, he could start a fire in that altar. Now, you know, 450 people without God is nothing. One man with God can do great things. Hallelujah. So, even if you are alone, do not be afraid, my dear brothers and sisters. The Lord is with us. In my mind, I see two altars on that mountain and I see one altar where... These, um, now these uh, worshippers of Baal are going to um, set it up. Uh, it is the, uh, you know, one side is the broken altar of the Lord. What once was a glorious altar. In verse 25 he tells the prophet of Baal, Choose which uh, one bullock for yourself and dress it first. For you are many, call on the name of your God. Don't put fire, let fire come. They said, he went, he told them, do whatever you want. Do all the magic, do all the mantras, 
do all the what you call um, uh, all types of pujas you can do what you want um, just let fire come you can hear the sarcasm in Elijah's voice there are so many of you do first in verse 26 the prophets decide to do what Elijah has said and they took the bullock they dressed it and called the name of the Baal from morning even and even until noon from 9 o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock 3 hours there was no voice the Bible says nor any that answered and they leaped upon the altar which was made in spite of all their efforts nothing happened at noon Elijah began to taunt them you see when God enters the picture none of these gods none of these sorcerers none of these magicians can do anything they have to step back their magic won't work their curses won't work nothing will work so if you are a believer you can be assured none of the curses will affect you amen hallelujah and it's and then it says it was in, at noon Elijah said oh, I had enough now and Elijah mocked them and it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked and said cry aloud for he is um, he's a God either he is talking or he is pursuing or he is on a journey or maybe he is sleeping he must, he must be awake now Baal was a God with human qualities he is the same he is the male version of the Indian God, uh, Goddess we have the cow God Kamadenu it's the same male version is Baya. There's no difference between them. You know, Elijah drives, makes, mocks this God. Maybe he said, maybe he is preoccupied. Maybe he is reading the newspaper and he is unable to hear you. And uh, you know, he said, uh, he is pursuing. Pursuing means he has gone away. Maybe he has gone to the toilet is the word used in Hebrew. Maybe he went to uh, take a shower. What a pathetic God would be that be. Maybe he was just out of office. As they say when you call somebody, oh he's gone out, he'll be back in a few minutes. Maybe it is that. You know, as uh, maybe he's sleeping, you may have to shout louder for him to hear. You know, Elijah knew that their God could not do anything. You must be assured, my dear brothers and sisters, today's world, their gods cannot do anything to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have a God who is above all gods. There is no one like him. And in this critical time, their God could not answer. So it says the prophets became more uh, aggressive. Verse 28-29 says, They cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancelet till blood gushed upon them. We see the same practices back home, right? They cut themselves. In so many religions they cut themselves and uh, the, even after noon they prophesied until the time of the offering and uh, they, and there was no neither voice nor any answer nor any that regarded yeah and they you know nothing nobody listened to them we had, they prophesied they were, you know, uttering um, pujas, prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. Their worship became more and more, you know, rhythmic and full of ecstasy. Like what you see uh, in um, rhythmic dancing of the um, religious people, leaping, cutting themselves. No matter what happened, there nothing, nothing was answered. Their God was deaf and dumb to their cries. The Bible speaks plainly in Psalm 115, 5 to 8. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet they have, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth them. You see? The misguided action of the prophets of Baal reminds us of a very important truth. Faith and sincerity are not enough. Faith is only as good as the God in whom you have faith. It does not matter whom your faith is placed. If, and sincerity, if you are sincere also, 
If it be a if it's a false god, you will lose the way. You know, the one thing about these prophets, they were sincere. They tried their best. So, if you want to be a channel of the power of God, one number one, you must be willing to, you know, uh, the first one was you must be willing to step up and be counted. The second one, if you want to be a channel of the power of God, you must be willing to stand alone. Number three, if you want to be the channel of the power of God, you must rebuild the altars which are broken down. You know, people were watching these prophets. They had an unsuccessful attempt. Elijah calls attention to these people and he tells them and uh, uh, he says, Come near me. All the, all the people came near unto him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. So imagine he built the altar and made a pit around it. So it was two measures of seed means about approximately two feet deep. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid on the wood and said, fill four barrels of water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice on the wood. And he said, he said second time and he said third time and the water ran about the altar and and fill the trench also with water. After some afternoon, Elijah started the process of rebuilding the altar and preparing his sacrifice. There is a twofold significance in what Elijah did. He rebuilt the altar which was broken down. The, the very fact that the altar of the Lord was in disrepair or broken up is a symbol that how much the people were gone far away from God. He used the 12 stones of the 12 tribes. Even though Israel at that time was only made up of 10 nations, he used 12 because God is known by the 12, is known as the Lord of the 12 tribes. And then he readied the sacrifice in time for the evening sacrifice. Then he did an interesting thing. Uh, he said, pour water over it. Again and again till everything was soaked with water. You know fire and water don't get along. So he wanted to be clear that none could be, uh, there would be no doubt. You know my dear brothers and sisters, this is a great symbol for every believer. The altar of our family prayer. The altar of your, your prayer time with God. We have to rebuild we have to reinstate if we are not doing it already. First, it must be built in the word of God. It must be based on the God Almighty. Second, it must be soaked with water. Water usually in the Bible is the, is the indication of the Holy Spirit. Our altar must be soaked with the presence of the Holy Spirit. We need to soak it that it must overflow. Then the fire will come, my dear brothers and sisters. The altar at home, the altar in, in, your, uh, in your personal time, the fire will come. So what is this fire going to do? It is going to burn the impurities in us. It is going to mortify the deeds of the flesh. You, you have to submit at the altar because the Bible says, Hebrews 1.7, He will make His ministers a flame of fire. You know, they, we are, today we are powerless. Our children don't have desire for God. It's because we have lost the fire of, the, of God. We have lost the altar of God. We have failed to show our children the display of the glory of God. If you show your, your children the dis display of God's glory, why will they go to other sources? If you don't show display of God's glory, the devil will show his glory to they, your children, my dear brothers and sisters. You cannot blame anybody if you lose your children without salvation. It, we are, we are, as parents, we are responsible. As the head of the house, man, you are responsible. Today is Father's Day. Today is a good day to make a commitment to build the altar for the Lord. It is never too late to change. He said, Elijah told the people, pour water and soak it. It was an amazing thing. He was looking for fire. 
but here he was putting something which is against fire. Can you imagine that when you have the, um, you know, the freedom in the presence of God, you can do anything you want. God will still answer you like what he promised. And Elijah made it so impossible for anyone to even think about anything because he wanted to make it clear that only God can do that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if you want to be the channel of God's blessing, you have to step up and be counted. The second thing, what, I have, what did we say? If you want to be the channel of God's blessing, what should you do? You may have to stand alone. The third thing, you have to rebuild the broken altars. Number four, if you want to be the ch channel of the power of God, you must have a God who will answer. Hallelujah. The big contrast between Baal and the Almighty God. In verse, and in, it says, and uh, it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and of Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant and I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know thou art the Lord God and thou hast turned their heart back again. Elijah didn't scream. Elijah didn't make all this natak drama. But what? He prayed a simple prayer. Remember, powerful public prayers will only come from secret, long time of prayer with God. If you have long hours of prayer with God, in public you don't have to say more than this. It was a simple prayer, two line prayer. There nothing. You know, Isaiah told this in Isaiah 65, 24. He said, In, in Isaiah 65, 24, it shall come to pass that before they will call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Elijah's prayer had three elements, which you can write down, which you can have in your prayer. He prayed that God would be recognized as the one true God. Everything I do, Lord, I want people to recognize that you are true God. It is not about me. It is not about my family. It is not about what I have or what I don't have. It is about you, Lord. It is about you. He prayed that people would know that he was truly his prophet. Lord, I want people to know that I am truly your servant. I want to, people to know that I am on your side. I am not on the side of the world. And then the third thing, he prayed that the hearts of people will turn back to his God. The result, as he was praying, even before he finished, the fire of the Lord fell. Based, We just read Isaiah 65, 24. And consumed the bird sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dust, and the water. It was like a bomb falling there and everything evaporated. It's like a nuclear bomb. You know? And then the people fell on their face and cried. That the Lord, He is God. He is God. He is God. Then Elijah told them, take the prophets of Baal and kill them. The fire fell, my dear brothers and sisters. It will burn away the dust. It will burn away the impurities. It will burn away your weaknesses. It will burn away your sorrow. It will burn away this. It will make you a, a person who is clean. That's what is the altar will do. The uh, fire... Um, which can consume a water-soaked sacrifice, water-soaked wood, water-covered stones, water-covered dirt, cannot be done by human hands. This is the work of the Lord. He is God. He is God. Then they go and kill the prophets of Baal. You see, here is a small riddle for you. I want to ask you, I want to put a small test. There are three frogs sitting on the log. Two decide to jump off. How many are left on the log? Three. You know why the answer is three? Just because you decide, it doesn't mean you have jumped off the log. Just because you decide, oh, I want to follow Jesus, it doesn't mean that you have followed him. Your action has to show your decision. I just wanted to drive home this point. 
How does it relate to us this Sunday afternoon? You can say you have decided to follow Jesus. You can sing about following Jesus. You can shout about the, the I don't have to be afraid of the Lord. But you are not following him until you are actually following him. I don't care what you have decided my dear brothers and sisters. It is not your decisions which I, which I want. It is your action that I want. Let me put Elijah's question in today's context. If Jesus is God, follow him. If anything else or anyone is God, follow it. But stop playing games. Don't act Christianity. Don't be, uh, you know, what you call, uh, put on the mask of Christianity. Don't put on them, you know, the sweet talk of Christianity. Oh, brother, how are you, brother? Praise the Lord, brother, praise. But if your life is not reflecting the glory of God, if you cannot treat your wife properly, you cannot treat your children properly, you cannot treat your clients properly, you cannot treat your neighbors properly, what is the use of singing? What is the use of your faith? What is the use of my faith if I cannot show it to the people around me? Your own family, your own friends, your own people. This is it's time to stop playing games, my dear brothers and sisters. Stop sitting on that fence. Stop starting to behave like Christians. Start being real Christians. Take a stand for what you think is true. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. It is time to make that decision. Whatever be the situation, Lord, I am going to rebuild my altar. I am going to take a stand. I am going to be, even if I am alone, I am going to take a stand. Maybe like Job, your wife or husband may not be with you. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. When you take a stand, when they will see the fire of God come upon you, when they will see the glory of God in you, Everyone will come to the Lord. Everyone will come to the feet of the Lord. It is not your victory. It is the victory of the Almighty God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are only here to show who God is. You are not here to show yourself. It is not about you. It is not never, never about me or my family or my children. It is about the Lord Jesus Christ. It is about the fire of God displaying you. Because the fire of God does wonderful things. It will, it will talk to people. It will convince people. It will change people. It is time. Think about your life. Think about everyone should think about their life, including me. Are we, are we, have we been able to rebuild the altars? Have we been able to soak it with the Holy Spirit? Have we been able to cry out to the Lord and the fire will come? And it will burn away everything. It will burn away our dross. It is time to show the world that the glory of God is in us. It is time to show the world that we can bring the glory of God to the people. It is time to show the world that we are the light of the world. It is time to show the world that we are the salt of the earth. It is time, brothers and sisters, we have too long acted and behaved and made drama about Christianity, about our Christian faith. It is time to live it. It is time to take action. I leave this with you. Read this chapter again. Think about the human side of this. We never, in our stories, we refuse to read the other side of the, uh, of the story. Here, God is wanting to speak to you. Open your hearts. Let Him speak to you. Allow Him. Take the stand. Take the stand. Don't be hesitant. Don't be hesitant. Now is the time. Today is the call. Today the Lord is asking you, are you willing to take a stand? Are you willing to say like Joshua 24, 15, Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, whatever be the cost. The, co the cost, what we are able to give here is nothing, my dear brothers and sisters. The cost was already paid. The greatest cost ever was, that is the death of the Son of God. Time to make the decision. Time to take, take time. You don't have to even think about it even now. But if you make a decision, stick by it. Otherwise, count the cost. Count the cost. Don't be like that man, like what Lord Jesus gave example, that he started to build the tower and realized he doesn't have enough money. We shouldn't do things like that. Count the cost. And if you are unable to make the decision, go to the Holy Spirit. 
kneel down before him kneel down before the almighty god and say lord i am unable to make the decision but i don't want to be like the israelites i want to take a stand even though if i am alone yeah, i want to stand up and be counted i want to build my altar at home and i want to um, i want to have a god who answers he will be a god of the people who will rebuild altars and he will be a god who answers thank you father commit your word into their into everybody's hands lord lord whatever you have spoken to them lord the bible says the horse is ready for the battle but the victory is from the lord lord i can preach till my throat tears lord but if you don't work in anybody's heart it will be a waste lord i pray that this word will dwell richly that it will fall on good ground that it will bring forth fruit that people will build their altars at home in their personal life in and lord and they will display your glory to everyone around i thank you lord i commit this into your hands be the glorified in the name of our lord jesus we pray amen amen the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you the lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of jesus amen 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 god bless you all have a wonderful week we will celebrate this anniversary uh, when we are all going to meet again <laughs> i don't know when that will happen but shortly i presume god bless you all